Hi, this is BK from ManForWars.com, where I'm promoting polite patriotism to help nice ladies and gents worldwide, offline, locally teach kids to be, and uh, to help the same polite patriots worldwide, offline, locally discuss and share great info they find online with their neighbors, connecting with them, giving them a chance to hear different, think for themselves, if it's stupid, laugh at or correct it, if it's smart, enjoy and pass it on, make better people and better places to live. So. Uh, this stuff is actually uh, popular in the public, even though um, it's not talked about. We're supposed to be gender equal, gender neutral, the same fashionably uncomfortable uh, commie zombie or corporate clone mess. Um, and that's a problem because then uh, our commie zombie kids, uh, you know, will, will kill us because we had nice stuff. And Greta said that made the weather, weather bad and that destroyed the earth. So we got to try and avoid stuff like that. So do uh, like, comment, subscribe, support the channel uh, and these efforts as you'd like. And, and it'll be easier for us to speak about these things instead of just sneaking around and finding a few people left to be polite with as it sort of fades from our cultures. Um, so that's a bit on manforwars.com. And this video is called Oh Canada. Good cops are exposing bad cops and need our help. And I've got a couple of little notes here. Um, and this is based on a, a video by uh, Dan Dix from PressForTruth.ca, who does uh, great work. So support his uh, YouTube, BitChute, and other channels and, and his work. Um, and it says, Bombshell Report. Transactions revealed Nova, Scoter, Nova Scotia shooter may have been RCMP informant or agent. Now, Dan didn't do the investigative uh, journalism on this. This is actually Dan commenting on a McLean's Magazine article. And McLean's Magazine is a very mainstream Canadian magazine, sort of like Time Magazine in the United States, right? It's a, it's a general, you know, all-purpose kind of kind of magazine that uh, that's a, um, it's, um, covers Canadian events like Time Magazine. And so what happened is, um, you know, basically there was a, a major shooting in uh, Nova Scotia, a province on the east coast of Canada, in that shooting, around uh, 20 people were killed, and uh, the shooter um, was somebody who was known to the RCMP. Um, there were, uh, uh, you know, questions about him uh, having illegal guns. There were issues with him abusing uh, his girlfriend and, and having a domestic violence incident, and yet the RCMP did not investigate him for that. So why not? Well, typically, um, if somebody is an informant, you don't investigate them. Um, and, and, you know, if, if, if he's working for you, then, you know, if he belongs to intelligence, as they say Jeffrey Epstein did, at least Alexander Acosta, uh, former labor secretary in the DA in charge of prosecuting Epstein many, many years ago on uh, soliciting a minor charges, said, I'm not going to push this. He belongs to intelligence, right? So um, the theory is that, um, that, that, you know, he was treated sort of like an RCMP officer. Plus, he uh, took out about $475,000 worth of cash from a bank uh, from uh, through CIBC and Brinks. And, um, and that's typically, as other RCMP officers commented in this McLean's article, that's typically how uh, uh, they pay off their, their uh, informants, their, their um, agents when, when they have to do some stuff. They do everything in cash. They try and make it untraceable. And otherwise, um, they're offered services that you know the average Canadian wouldn't be offered. So um, basically, um, in Nova Scotia, this guy had, uh, you know, uh, uh, people said he had, we think he has illegal guns. wasn't investigated. Uh, he had a domestic violence issue. wasn't investigated. wasn't seriously taken seriously. Um, he had an RCMP police cruiser, um, and um, and it was virtually identical, save for uh, some minor registration numbers and, and things like that. A couple little little minor details, but it looked like an RCMP cruiser, right? And uh, this guy had a dental business, but even so, there was no way he needed to take out that much money. So um, you can see, um, I'll put a link to the video below, and you can check out pressfortruth.ca uh, for more, or the McLean's Magazine article for more. But my point in saying this is that there are good officers, or at least not horrible officers, or at least officers trying to save their skin with a lot of the defund the police kind of stuff out there and, and attacks on law enforcement, so whatever. Um, but there are good RCMP officers who spoke to McLean's magazine and a journalist there and said, hey, we want to tell you that we think that this guy was an RCMP informant, right? So there are good cops trying to, uh, uh, you know, um, expose bad cops and they need the help of us Canadians out there to say, yo, pass this on. Did you hear about this? Right. And so to frame that and understand that. I want to make it clear that we have to support whistleblowers like this uh, so that we see more, right? Um, and, um, and, and, and basically the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, um, are similar to the FBI in, uh, in, in America, right? There's the CIA, which handles foreign intelligence work, 
In Canada, we have CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Services. They're supposed to handle foreign stuff, right? Uh, uh, figuring out who's spying on us from people overseas or who's doing wrong things when it comes to foreign activities or spying on them, right? And, uh, and they may do some domestic stuff. There's no doubt the CIA and, and, and CSIS probably do screw around in, in, uh, yeah, in, in America and Canada, respectively. But they're not, that's not their charter. That's not what they're supposed to do. Meanwhile, um, the FBI in the U.S. is their domestic intelligence service, and the uh, RCMP in Canada is Canada's domestic intelligence service. So um, basically, um, they've also been caught before uh, 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 provocateuring things. They've been caught uh, encouraging terrorists. You know, these terrorists are, 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 they get some sort of mentally ill people like in the Ottawa bombing that was supposedly stopped and they kind of encourage them and the guy's like, I don't think I want to die for jihad. I just, I'm not that into it. And the RCMP is like, oh, come on. Well, I've got some debts. My parents have some debts to pay. And if I die, I won't be able to pay them. We'll pay them for you. We'll pay them for you. Just, just go through with this bombing, right? So, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the guy who's, uh, the guy and his wife were brought up on charges for that, uh, were let off because the judge was like, look, this guy didn't want to do this. You just kept pushing him and bribing him and cajoling him into doing this, right? And often they will stage uh, false flag uh, terror events specifically to keep them in business. Because if there isn't terror, if there aren't domestic terror incidents, then, hey, why do we need an RCMP? Why does America need an FBI? Why do they need a lot more funding? Or there was the Toronto 18 case where um, supposedly um, some guys were going to buy some fertilizer to create a truck bomb. The RCMP put an informant in there who was the only person that could, uh, uh, with their license as an engineer, buy the fertilizer. The other people, it's like, why would you want that kind of fertilizer? What's your background? We can't sell it to you. So the RP, RCMP put a guy, Mubin Sheikh, uh, into the Toronto 18 terror cell that they were kind of backing and supporting. A bunch of sort of lower intelligence, you know, uh, people kind of hopped up on on jihadi thoughts. And... Um, but not really seriously acting, right? They were just taking some of the RCMP money and screwing around and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so the, RC, uh, the, the RCMP put an informant in there with the background to say, I've got the credentials, I'm a chemical engineer, so I want to buy a ton of fertilizer. And the fertilizer was delivered to a warehouse 500 meters away from the RCMP detachment. So they basically went across the street and arrested him when the fertilizer showed up. And that was the Toronto 18 case. And right after that, the RCMP got like a $500 million boost in their budget, right? So <clears throat> the reason I bring all that up is there's a war going on inside, you know, pretty much everywhere, right? Just like, you know, everywhere you work, there are good and bad people, right? You could work at a Starbucks and there are some good people working there, some nice, polite, friendly, cool people, right? And there might be a couple of uh, jerkier people who, who work there, right? Some people that are, you know, uh, uh, rude or, or a mess or a bitch or whatever, or a bastard or a bitch, you know, or whatever, right? There, there's some good and bad people that work everywhere, right? And then when it comes to law enforcement and the government, of course, they have much more power and, and money and responsibility and influence on the rest of us. So there's a war going on inside different agencies, inside the deep state, inside the CIA, inside the FBI, inside the CSIS, inside the RCMP, um, inside uh, the various police services, Toronto police services or New York police services or whatever, right? There's, there's a war going on inside these different groups. And so we have to help the good cops who are exposing the bad cops by supporting them and, 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 and getting the word out there. So I'm encouraging Canadians out there to promote this McLean's uh, story or Dan Dick's PressForTruth.ca uh, report on this. Um, and, um, and yeah, um, you know, um, when it comes to this, there's, um, there's you know, uh, even with myself, I've had experience uh, during the G20 martial law event. I think it was 2010. I was hosting a radio show at the time. I covered it for my radio show. Um, you know, it was crap show before, crap show during the actual protest. The week or two leading up to it, they brought 20,000 cops from across Canada to deal with the protesters. I was going, when the government invites you to a fight with the cops, don't go. Win the offline info war. The media is making everyone interested in the G20. Share some information with them. Have conversations with them. Put up posters and flyers. Give out DVDs. You know, uh, give people conversation points where they can really talk about globalization um, and talk about the G20 and should the world be run by this, right? But, um, you know, um, instead, you know, a lot of people, you know, people like being social, it's a big party. 
um, you know, thousands of people went to the big government, invites you to a fight with the cops. Events covered that. Huge crap show, right? Um, and even in the week before, right, the cops staring down people, glaring at people. I'm out there with my video camera and, and recorder going, guys, chill out. You're wearing wool suit. You're going to have a stroke, right? Don't scare everybody in the week leading up to this, right, because everyone's quiet. You're glaring. So where's the protesters? They're all hopped up like it's a football game and they're trying to kill the other team, which is everybody because anybody could be a potential protester slash black block, you know, before Antifa was black block or whatever terrorist, right? So, um, you know, and, and then, you know, I did that for a couple of days and I saw them, came back and they were pretty chilled out, relatively speaking, instead of staring and glaring, more like, you know, head up, hands in their waist, you know, head in a swivel, you know what I mean? And so, you know, chilled out a bit. Um, but, but, but during the protest itself, it was a total mess, right? And, um, and as a journalist, I was at a second cup coffee shop uh, near uh, Queen and John Street, near the, the City TV uh, building in downtown Toronto. And I was hanging out in a patio with a fellow journalist in the summer of 2010. And uh, a couple of police officers approached us. And um, they were just cops in uniform, right? Uh, Toronto Police Services cops. This was right after the G20, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, martial law uh, uh, event when, when the cops cracked down on everybody and the summit itself of the G20 leaders, the, the 20 most powerful, uh, economically powerful nations in the world, right, which was held in Toronto. Um, and these cops approached us and they were like, you know, hey, yeah, you know, how you doing, guys? You know, like, hey, it's all good. You know, we kind of, um, you know, through our communication, identified ourselves as journalists. And I think they kind of knew us or recognized us as journalists in some fashion, right? Um, and they came to us to tell us their stories. Right, and they didn't. We, they didn't have it off record, but I mean, you could you could take my word for it as a journalist. I didn't record them specifically, but they wanted to talk to us about what their experiences were, and they were saying to us, "Yeah, during the G20, we think the G20 commanders that were ordering the rest of the street cops to do this and that, we think they were drunk. We think they were drunk, right? We don't think they were. You know, we think they were drunk and they were just messing around, right? Because it would be 5:30 in the morning." And the cops in the street would get a call in their, you know, radio head, head you know, earpiece or whatever saying, hey, uh, you know, huge event down at Queen of Spadina. Go, go, go. Right. And so the guys would get on their bikes or whatever and just fly down there. Not sure what would happen. I looked in their eyes when I was covering this and I could see some fear. Like, what if I show up and something blows up and I never see my family again? Right. Um, but um, but basically, so they were getting calls at like 530 in the morning to race through Toronto to a certain intersection and when they get there, nothing's happening. And they're hearing the G20 commanders laughing, you know, over, over their earpiece or in their radio about having just sent them to, to do that, right? So, um, you know, I'm trying to say that, 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 you know, there are some good cops for even their own protection, right? Who want to expose uh, bad cops or bad cop leadership. Because if, 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 if regular cops get corrupted, then, you know, it's a crappier place to work. If the leadership gets corrupted, it's a crappier place to work and they'll be ordered to do crappier things, right? So that's why it's important, you know, and having dealt with this myself, it's not just me. Joe Warmington, a columnist of the Toronto Sun, also was approached by police and they did speak to him. He interviewed them and he wrote articles in the Toronto Sun saying regular cops don't like the way the G20 summit slash martial law where they cracked down on the whole city, they built a huge barrier, they, you know, got in riot gear and they attacked, you know, protesters when they were peaceful. Um, you know, it was it was a it was a huge mess. Because it wasn't like like today's BLM Antifa riots. There wasn't a lot of that going on. There was some, there was some, in fairness, but there wasn't a lot of that breaking windows, destroying property, attacking people. There was just a little bit of it here and there. And and the, you know, there's even a famous scene where there's a bunch of protesters sitting on the ground and a bunch of riot police kind of, you know, in their full gear and with their shields and stuff, you know, kind of, uh, you know, 50 feet away from them. And these protesters are singing, Oh, Canada, sitting down, singing, Oh, Canada. And, you know, uh, right at the end of them singing, we stand on guard for the boom, the, 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 the cops rushed them. Right. And you, this is on video and Protesters are like, holy crap, what the hell's happening? Right? We're just sitting here singing Oh Canada. And as soon as the song ends, right on cue, they get a little order in their in their earpiece, go. And they rushed them and they attacked them and they, you know, beat on them and, and kettled them, get, you know, couldn't find them in an area or whatever. So that's all the orders that they're getting, right? The average cops don't typically act like that. The average cop is going to see you singing 
O Canada or Crazy by Gnarls Barkley or some classic Celine Dion hit or something like that and just go, all right, as soon as they finish the song, rush them as an individual cop, right? That's not what they do. That's the orders, right? Um, so that's why it's important for us to get um, to get the, um, the, the leadership out there uh, or, or, or to get the, uh, the word out about these whistleblowers. Um, finally, um, you know, as, as, as an end note, uh, men need to man up and talk about this stuff instead of bitching out and being a mess, acting like and putting up with a mess, because that's key, because it's really, you know, it's definitely a, you know, a, a thing that, that, that we're more interested in doing. Nothing against women. I like strong women, you know, strong men have strong women. Everyone's more confident. Weak men have, you know, there's no men for women to be nice to and empowering with, right? So, you know, if a man's a mess, then a woman's not going to be anything except a mess, and then kids aren't going to be anything except a mess. So it's important for men to man up and uh, and help us deal with this especially. And uh, that's something I've been advocating at manforwars.com. And as I said, it's very popular on a street level, right? It's very popular with people I meet, with people here and there. You know, I'm not fashionably a mess, fashionably messy, you know, with people, fashionably uncomfortable, can't really look at people, can't really look at you, it's too uncomfortable of a thing to do, right? Or uh, people make you uncomfortable, you make them uncomfortable too, and you can't really pay attention to each other, and, and you're more isolated and divide and conquer and just a mess near other people. That's not something I do. So I get different feedback from people where they go, okay, you've got self-respect, you're not messing with people, you're not paying attention to people messing with people, it's safe to be nice to you. So I get guys, young men playing basketball with, where I got some of my tan from, um, you know, who just go, okay, it's, it's, it's cool, it's cool, man up, right? Or guys talking about COVID-19, say guys in their early 20s or whatever, and they're like, not sure what to say, not sure if we can be cool, if I express myself comfortably, will you still be okay with me? Like, yeah, 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 come on, chop, 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 you know, I'm, 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 I'm a man, you know, I, I, this is what I think, and I'm not going to waste my time or your time, what the hell do you think, right? And then they go, oh, okay, and they kind of puff their chest out a bit. Well, you know, I think this is BS. I'm not sure about this, but, and so they go, go, go. And then girls see that with the confident masculine strength, and it triggers their confident feminine vulnerability where they relax and they want to be good company and they want to be appreciated for being good at being girls because we're good at being men, right? And it's appropriate for our age, looks, relationship, situation, and so on. So that's a real big key. Um, and there you have it. So BK from manforwars.com. Like, comment, subscribe, uh, get in touch with questions or support as you'd like. Hope this helps and I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.